This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A L T I Z E N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to John Russell in a two-episode arc on the major acquisitions that are shaking the Asia landscape from Southeast Asia to China. In the second part, we discuss the recent acquisitions by May 20 and Ping with Mobike and Alibaba with LME in China. Welcome back, and with me, John Russell, reporter at TechCrunch. Well, John, since I have you here, I might as well get you for a second episode because in the same week after the Uber Southeast Asia and Grab deal happened, there were bigger deals happening in Northeast Asia and I'm talking about China. I think in the last two days, there were two big stories that came up. One of it is May Tuan Tianping acquiring Mobike, the bike sharing app for US $2.7 billion and Alibaba acquiring Ali.me, which is a, I think is a food delivery company for US $9.5 billion. I think to set the context, I guess, Meituan Tianping is part of the second wave of China technology giants known as the TMD. In case you don't know, the abbreviation is Toutiao or some people know them as Bike Dance and Meituan Tianping and DD. So why did the deal happen? Because bike sharing is not a sustainable business, probably. <laughs> I, I, think there's, I think there's so many reasons, right? It's definitely an interesting one. And whereabouts do you want to start here? There's, there's quite a lot to get into, right? I think let's start from the perspective of Meituan Dianping has been quietly challenging Didi's dominance in the ride-hailing space by starting experiments of their ride-sharing service in third and fourth tier cities in China. And the fact that they have acquired Mobike and let them run independently as a brand does speaks to volumes that they want to make sure that Didi doesn't own the entire ride-hailing and the transportation sector. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so they did some pilots at the end of uh, last year, you said, and then last month they began doing something a bit more serious in Shanghai. And apparently it's, well, obviously they, the company's only able to tell you when it's going good, but they, you know, they've been quite happy with what they've seen. I guess the next stage to that is, you know, adding bike sharing in the same way that a couple of years back DD first did that with investments. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's the second piece to the on-demand uh, transportation play, right? You get in car sharing or car, car hailing and then you get into the bikes too. And it's also interesting because Mumbai has also started a ride hailing service as well in the Chinese cities as well. One of the key elements of this deal is that Meituan Dianping actually acquiring this company for 35% in equity and 65% in cash. And of that is about 320 million. And all the series A and B round investors are now exiting with 750 million in cash. I know one of them is Vertex Ventures in Singapore, who actually were one of the early investors of this deal for both A round and B round. I think the question is, uh, what will happen to Ofo then? Because Ofo is actually owned by Didi and Alibaba. And already, I read from the information that Didi and Alibaba are not happy with each other because Didi wants to control Ofo, like the way what Meituan Dianping wants with mobile. And Alibaba wants it to be independent. So would there be some form of consolidation of the ride-sharing space happening in China? That kind of relationship that you, that you mentioned, the DD uh, off relationship, it seems like a mess, really. Yeah. There's been a lot, lots of reports that DD sent people over. After they invested in the, in the company, they sort of sent execs over to help run the business. And Otho didn't really want that interruption, and they sort of sent them back. You know, they had a bit of a, a, a strained period. And then I guess... Didi saw them as a company that is that's actually com- com- competing with them, right? So, so rather than you know than than taking Didi's taxis for like sh- shorter sort of trips, there was mounting evidence that you know Chinese consumers are using bike sharing services, right? And so I think that Didi rather than, uh, they they saw this is what I think anyway, but this is not based off of uh, any any sources or whatever. But I think that they saw them as a as a nice company that they could do an investment in, they can understand more about the bike sharing space, potentially bring them in as as a full acquisition, right? Offer didn't really see it that way. And I guess that as the, the more popular that, that the service got, the more they thought that they could actually, you know, do things on their own. And I think it came to a head when DD launched uh, its bike sharing platform, right? So, and r- so the, 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 the aim of that, that I can see is it, instead of consumers who were wanting to do a short trip, maybe say they've gone on the, on the subway and they want to complete the journey to their office and they would hire a 
buy it, Didi wanted them to stop going into the, into the offer app and come back into the Didi app. And so they built out this bike sharing feature that includes a number of different companies that includes Ofo and Blue Gogo, right, which that went broke that DD bought up. And so the idea is that these apps, rather than being like separate apps that consumers go to outside of the DD app, they become like a like a feature that sits inside inside the DD service. So DD gets people going to its app on a daily basis and it doesn't lose engagement to others. So I think their approach, they probably wanted to do exactly what what uh, May Two One's done, but they didn't have the buy-in on Ofo's side. So I think that's where the basis of all of this between those two comes from. And I thought that actually Mumbai being more independent, they might have a better shot of actually becoming the transportation challenger to Didi. But it seems that now Meituan Tianping has co-opted them into their space. So it's actually been quite a big drama going on in the bike sharing space. But what does that also mean for bike sharing space in general? I mean, for those in the US might heard of companies like Lime Bikes, Spin, and we heard that Uber is now considering acquiring a small startup called Jump Bikes in the US. There's obviously a lot going on, right? I think it's so tough to be a company that's not based in these markets and being active in them too. So I don't honestly know how well Ofo and Mobike are doing in the US, but I've definitely heard in the UK that they're, that they're doing okay. But I think there's a whole d- different kind of topic there about the kind of differences in culture between you know the ch- Chinese market and these other places, right? Because, because bikes have already been very, very popular in China and other parts of Asia too. Whereas in the UK, like if you bike to work, that's not what is normally done, right? That's not the done thing normally. So I think there's all kinds of different stages where these kind of concepts are at. So I think it's a bit of a d- different kind of topic to, to what is happening in China and I guess in Southeast Asia too. Mm. I, and I thought that Uber acquiring a bike sharing service is copying what the Chinese is doing in China. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. It is. And I guess it, it's interesting because again, this is a trend that's played out in China first. And it's, it's not quite the same, right? So as I understand it, jump bikes are not quite the same as as Ofo and Mobike. Electric bikes, right? You know, but I mean, the basic thing is the same, right? Is that people on a, who are doing short short trips they feel much better about doing it on a bike right you don't have to wait for somebody to come and find you and then it's like where are you which side of the road are you this is a way easier way to do it you know it's quite good to get on a bike and actually and actually pedal right (laughs) exercise wise (laughs) and i think that this is going to be something to watch and maybe bike sharing is really a fad in the end, everyone gets acquired by the transportation right-hailing giants in the space. I, I don't think it's a, it's a fad, but maybe as a business, it's like more of a, of a feature than it is of a natural company in its own right, right? So if you're a ride-hailing company, then you kind of want to have the option to do a bike sharing. But is bike sharing itself going to beat the taxi app companies? Probably not, right? But if you're a taxi app company and say 10% of your users are not you know, doing that short trip and they're doing it on a bike instead, then that's a reason for you to go and buy this company, even if it's not like a profitable uh, business. I think we want to talk about the other big deal that happened because it's a larger deal that Alibaba will buy out Ele.me, E-L-E.me, which is actually the largest online delivery and local services platform, but they're most well-known for food deliveries. The deal of the value is $9.5 billion. So... The question for me is that with Alibaba flexing its muscles, because you also broke a story that Alibaba is planning to invest in Grab. Does that mean we're going to have more acquisitions and more consolidation happening, not just in China, but outside China from Southeast Asia to India? I think it's so fascinating, right? How there are these, these two companies that are, you know, have these empires underneath them, right? So, you know, uh, Meituan and, and uh, Mobike are both Tencent companies, right? So Tencent has an invested in, in those in those two companies. And it, there's always like the yin and the yang, right? So every investment that Ali or Barbara or Tencent does, the other one does one in a, in a competing company. And I guess, as you, as you mentioned, like, Ile Ma, right? I think that's how you pronounce it in Chinese. That's one that's been happening for some time, right? So Tencent invested in them for the first time a couple of years ago. Then they raised their investment again. And then the, the last piece was to buy out their other in, in, investors in the company and make it into their sort of their wholly owned uh, b- business. And that competes directly with Me Too One, right? So as you mentioned, Southeast Asia, right? So so they've all got their, their claws in Southeast Asia. So Alibaba's a couple of deals 
Lazada being the most obvious one, but also Tokopedia, right? So another uh, e-commerce company in Southeast Asia. Tencent is a Gojek investor. And Meituan is also a Gojek investor. I think that they see Gojek as having the potential to be like an on-demand company, not just a, you know, a bikes or, or sort of car taxi company. And so I think it makes sense, right? Alibaba doesn't actually have, it's not inside Uber. You know, SoftBank is obviously being a long-term ally of Alibaba. Barber has back grabbed since I think 2015. So you always thought like, at what point is is Amazon gonna uh, is um, Alibaba gonna get in? From what I understand, anyway, now that this Grab Uber deal has been announced, Alibaba is planning yeah to, to invest in Grab, and it's quite there's quite a long backstory to it too actually, and it goes back to Tokopedia. So Tencent was very close to doing a deal with. Tokopedia that would have that would have put them inside the inside the company along with uh, JD, which is an e- e-commerce company that Tencent is invested in. At the last minute, you know, SoftBank obviously mentioned this to Alibaba, and Alibaba decided that they wanted in on the deal. And SoftBank, having been an investor in Tokopedia since I think 2015 or so, they basically forced the deal through. So Tencent didn't get in. And Alibaba ended up leading like a $1.1 billion investment in Tokopedia in about August time. And so they put the deal with Grab on the back burner. And I guess, you know, SoftBank probably had plans at that point to invest in Uber and then to get Uber out of Southeast Asia. So it all made sense to get that issue done first. And as I mentioned, like now that that's done, the road is very much clear for Alibaba to to invest in Grab. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because they've been doing deals with big companies in Southeast Asia. And you know, Grab is probably the biggest in terms of you know h- how much it's worth. Grab is also doing a lot of stuff in the fintech and payment space, which Alibaba and Ant Financial, its fintech focused kind of firm, have been doing deals across you know multiple markets in Southeast Asia and in Korea and, and beyond. So getting into, into Grab and, and also the Grab pay business is very much the kind of thing that you would think that they would do anyway. I thought it was interesting to also explain a little bit about how the Chinese technology giants have been playing in Southeast Asia and India. They have been taking a very long-term view, whether it's Alibaba or Tencent. If you probably would not know this, but Amazon Prime started in Singapore and faced so much problems because they had no access to the logistics because Alibaba invested in Singapore Post, which is a former company. They locked out the API logistics runway for Amazon. So I think increasingly you're going to see the US companies are going to start to have problems entering to these markets because the, the best and brightest companies are all invested between Alibaba and Tencent. Yeah, I mean, it also seems like anecdotally, like they, the, the Chinese companies are the only ones that really care, right? Yeah, and this is very strange to me as well. I'm wondering why Amazon, Google, or Facebook are not even worried about being locked out of the market. I mean, I, I guess Facebook is too is too busy right now with you know all those fires that are sort of going on with its business. I think Google has done has done a couple of direct investments in India and uh, obviously did Gojek in Southeast Asia, and they're doing a lot more. You know, they're they're looking for the right deals in the region, but that's basically it, right? Like Amazon doesn't do acquisitions per se, right? Whereas you know Alibaba has been active, you know, since Ulus deal like a while back and and so yeah like they're, them doing deals I, I guess made Tencent sort of realized that there was something that was going on here and then they got into and I think India is the same right so Alibaba was the first one really to get into India of those two right they did the deal with the Paytm and they did other deals too and then and Tencent kind of a little bit slower but they've done sort of sort of uh, five plus plus deals too. So. Speaking of which there's a rumor about Amazon acquiring Flipkart I, I for one can't see that that deal happening would you? Well, I think the rumor is that, that they've looked the company over, right? That they've given it some like due diligence and thought about it in light of the fact that uh, Walmart is apparently going to going to buy it or is has been in, in talks over, over buying it. So, I mean, if that's the case and they just had a look, I think that makes sense, right? Because you would want to know what your competition is doing, right? But yeah, like Amazon buying it isn't the most obvious one to me either, really. I, I wouldn't get why they would do that. Yeah, because... I can't foresee Alibaba buying it either, which also left only JD.com, which is Jingdong, and probably Walmart coming in. And it is even stranger to me that why Walmart is not in Southeast Asia as well. Yeah, I think like uh, Tencent is is a potential buyer, right? In the future, like they didn't invest in uh, in Flipkart when they did the big 
the big deal last year, right? When I think well, Microsoft was another investor too, right? So I think Tencent is somebody that might buy in the future, but I guess that they probably feel like Walmart is in a good position to be able to manage that company better than them, right? I don't know. And, and that's, that's why they're not in Southeast Asia. I, I, I mean, I would imagine that US companies looking at the region probably think China's a bit too tough. I know Walmart has been in China before and they have a deal with JD now. They sort of exited China because it was a bit too tough and they work with uh, JD. And so I guess like India is the most obvious place to go first. And then after that, it's probably Southeast Asia. So, you know, who, who knows? They, they might already be looking at the at the region with a with a with a plan to come in uh, later which also makes sense from a point of view that eventually there will be even more e-commerce players springing up because you know the acquirers are going to start increasing because ali and tencent are starting to buy up companies in the region i think this is something that we will see or we will actually see maybe they basically consolidate and control the entire uh, space on e-commerce logistics and also transportation and probably financial services as well. Everything. That's the way it's going, right? I mean, absolutely. If you're looking at the investments that they're doing, right? They're getting in much earlier than everybody else. I mean, even if you are Walmart, right? What is the acquisition that you do to get into Southeast Asia? It's not obvious, right? Do you start your own business? Tough. That's right. And and this will probably be a bigger play as you will see between US and China technology giants fighting it out in our regions where we are living. So. John, many thanks for coming on the show and really great to have you to talk about two of the biggest deals that's happening, not just in Southeast Asia, but also in Northeast Asia with China. So in closing, how do my audience find you? I'm on Twitter, John Russell, and also a Telegram. I've been using Telegram quite a bit uh, lately, so you can find me there if you want to get in touch directly, or you can email jr at techbunch.com, which is my work email address. I also want to add that you also write a weekly newsletter called Asia Tech Review, right? Oh yeah, I should probably pl- plug that too, yes. <laughs> yes, I do, I do. <laughs> yeah, please subscribe to that newsletter because it really gives you all... Yeah, asiatechreview.com, yeah. And we have like a, there's a, there's a Telegram group that we started uh, out of curiosity really as an experiment, so you're welcome to, to come in there too. I'll put the links for Asia Tech Review and also the Telegram link onto the uh, podcast show notes as well. You can find me at Bernard Leung or at BernardLeung.com. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, and of course, Google Play in the US market. Tweet to me or give me five stars in iTunes store because it helps to enhance my discovery or a star on Pocket Cast and Overcast. Most importantly, send me your feedback via Twitter and I'm always responding to it. Once again, John, thank you for coming on the show. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much.